Okay, my name is Mark Harris, and I work for a group at NVIDIA called Developer Technology, which means that I support um, developers, um, mostly in industry, but also researchers. Um, and I'm going to talk about um, data parallel algorithms in CUDA. So um, the GPU is a data parallel processor. Uh, Dave's been talking about the fact that you run thousands of parallel threads on it, and ideally you have thousands of data elements to process with those threads. Um, and all data are processed by the same program um, at the same time. So when you, when you evoke a, a kernel, you tell it how many threads and blocks to run on, and every thread and block runs the same program. They might branch so that some threads or warps end up at different points in the, in the program, but they're all running the same program. Um, we call this a SPIMD computation model or single program, multiple data. Um, it's not quite SIMD for the whole machine because not every thread has to have the same program counter at the same time. Uh, different warps can diverge. Within a warp, it's SIMD, but otherwise it, it's, um, uh, there are multiple instruction pointers, so it's, it's multiple data. Um, or, sorry, single program, not single instruction. Um, so in contrast to other types of parallelism, um, Task parallelism is common with multi-core CPUs because you've got these kind of heavyweight cores that run heavyweight threads and you divide up your program. You can apply CPUs to, to data parallelism also, also but um, it's hard to apply a data parallel processor like a GPU to task parallel problems. Uh, and then instruction level parallelism, which is the kind of parallelism that you take advantage of with um, pipelining and um, SSE and things like that. Um, so, best, so the, you get the best results in CUDA when, when you think data parallel. And by that I mean that you design your algorithm for data parallelism. Um, that's not too difficult for something like nBody, which is naturally data parallel. Um, and also, when you understand the, paral parallel, the principles of parallel algorithmic complexity and efficiency, which I'll be talking about tomorrow more, um, but a little bit today, and um, use data parallel algorithmic primitives for data blocks, or building blocks, uh, which is what I'm talking about in this talk. So um, this has come up a little bit because CUDA, uh, this is built into the programming model of CUDA, but a common parallel computing pattern is data blocking. So we partition our data into um, blocks that are small enough to be staged in shared memory, um, and we assign each of those partitions to a thread block. And that's really not that much different from cache blocking on a CPU where um, you chunk up your computation so that you get um, maximum cache reuse. Um, and it provides several performance benefits. Among them, um, this way you, you have enough blocks to keep all of the multiprocessors on the chip busy. Um, allows you to use shared memory. Um, without the blocking, we couldn't have designed the chip with shared memory. Um, just because it would have been infeasible for all the processors to share it with, you know, latency and um, other physical constraints. Um, and shared memory allows you to cut the um, latency to memory because you keep data close to the processors. And because you break it up into blocks, you're likely to have coherent memory access patterns for loads and stores. Um, also in parallel computing, there are, there are a number of scenarios that come up a lot. Um, one is you might have many parallel threads that need to generate a single result from their collective data, and that's known as reduce. Um, you might have many parallel threads that need to partition their data on a given criterion, and that's known as split. So for example, all the values that are less than some pivot point, as in uh, quicksort. Um, or you might have many parallel threads that produce a variable, variable variable amount of output per thread, and this is known as stream compaction or just compact or expand. And so um, if we look at parallel reduction, I'm sure a lot of you are probably familiar with this stuff, but um, if we have a number of threads that each have a data value, shown here in the um, leaves of the tree, um, we want to reduce those to a single value. Typically we use a tree-based um, algorithm to reduce those where each thread uh, loads some number of values, in this case two values, for a binary tree reduction. Um, and so this is in contrast to a, a CPU where you might just do a sequential summation of the data, um, whereas on a GPU you're going to get the most 
the best use of your processors and your threads by doing a tree-based implementation. I say that on a CPU, you do a sequential implementation, but it turns out if you add a lot of values um, and they're all, they start out within the same range, you're going to get much better accuracy by doing a tree-based reduction anyway uh, on the CPU. Um, okay, so what so I talked about, it's important to know parallel reduction or parallel complexity principles, so I'll talk a little bit about that for um, reductions, and I'm going to come back to this tomorrow I use reduction as an um, optimization example. Um, so this tree takes obviously log n parallel steps, and each step does uh, each step s does n over two to the s operations, and so th what we call the step complexity is order log n, um, and then there's something called the work complexity, which is the total amount of operations performed, and if you work it out, you, it works out to n minus one operations, which is the same as the optimal summation on the CPU, and so therefore we call it work efficient. Um, now, if you have P threads that run physically in parallel, or P processors, then the time complexity, or basically the, the time it takes to run this on a parallel machine, is order of N over P plus log N, and that comes from um, Brent's theorem. Uh, so, um, and compare that to order N for sequential reduction, so if, if N is, um, so as long as the log N factor doesn't dominate, um, then you're going to get a, a scaling with the number of processors. Okay, so moving back to the scenarios I talked about before, um, uh, other than reduction, if we look at the split operation, here's just a demonstration of what that is. Given an array of, say, true and false elements and, we, uh, and their payloads, we want to resort those so that all the true elements are at the beginning and all the false are at the end. Um, and so, you know, it ends up looking like this. And this is useful in, in algorithms like sorting or building trees and other data structures. Um, the other example I gave uh, was variable output per thread where you just want to compact data. So we want to remove all the zero elements in this case, all the null elements. This is useful in, for example, collision detection. Um, this is a problem I'm interested in because I work on games and stuff. Um, and uh, so, for example, if each thread is processing a pair of um, objects and they're determining if there's a collision or not or a potential collision or not, then if you want to remove all the, the pairs that are not potentially colliding. Um, another variable output for thread ca case, uh, the general case, where you need to allocate a variable amount of storage per thread because a thread determines that it's going to generate two results or three results or zero results. Um, so in that case, we want to <laughs> write these out into an array, a compact array, um, where each thread writes its values together. Um, and so this, this is useful, for example, in a marching cubes algorithm for um, isosurface extraction from volume data, um, where each uh, cell in the, the volume grid might generate multiple triangles or no triangles. Um, and geometry generation, this is a... I showed these slides to a mixed audience, some of them, them doing graphics. So um, if you were, for example, gen have some input data that generates geometry in a scene um, and at each location there might be a variable amount of, of geometry generated, for example. Um, okay, so in the, all three of these examples, split, compact, and expand, uh, allocate, uh, each thread has to answer a simple question, and that's where do I write my output? Um, because if you don't know ahead of time how many elements you're going to write, then the thread doesn't know where it should start writing. And so the answer de depends well, on what the other threads write. And so we can answer this question with an algorithm called scan or parallel prefix sum. And um, you may or may not be familiar with this. It's been around for a long time, and it was in C star, for example, on the connection machine. Um, but given an array of elements and a binary associative associative operator with an uh, identity I, the scan of that array is, is shown here. So for example, if the operator is addition, then scan on this, this array 31704163, which is the same array that Guy Blalock used to use in his papers, um, it returns this, this array 03411151622. Um, so it's pretty simple. This is an exclusive prefix sum, which means that um, 
each element is the sum of all the elements before it, non-inclusive of its own value. And an inclusive prefix sum would be including the element itself. Um, but you can generate one from the other. So why is this interesting? Well, it's interesting because it's very simple and useful for many algorithms in parallel. Um, so this is just an incomplete list of things you can use this for. So radix sort and quick sort are two things we've done with this. Um, you can evaluate polynomials. You can solve recurrences. You can do lexical analysis. You can allocate um, processors or allocate memory. You can build histograms. You can build trees. You can do all kinds of things. Um, and I find this really fascinating because scan is not something that you would ever run across really in sequential computing. It's not something you need. Um, you can do all of these things in, on a sequential processor without the scan algorithm. Um, so just some literature. I don't know why this projector cuts everything off. But um, so scan was first proposed in APL by Alan Iverson back in the 60s. Um, and it was used, as I said, as a data parallel primitive on the connection machine. And um, Guy Blalock, who I think implemented the stuff on the connection machine, um, showed how you can use it for various parallel algorithms and, um, and proposed that it be um, a primitive in um, architectures and languages. Um, and then since GPUs, um, there's been a, little, a fair amount of work on SCAN um, because it's so useful. Um, Daniel Horn wrote an article and uh, used it for collision detection, I think, a few years ago. Um, but this was in order n log n. It was not work efficient SCAN. Hensley also did an n log n version and applied it to some area tables, which I'll talk about in a minute. And um, Shubo Sengupta um, and also Alexander Gress showed how, for uh, graphics applications again, how that could be implemented on the GPU in OpenGL in an order n algorithm. And then more recently, um, we, ha we have uh, two articles. One is in GPU Gems 3 on do implementing it in CUDA. And then uh, we have an extension of that that was in graphics hardware this year um, on doing what's called segmented scan, which I'll talk a little bit about, about later. Um, okay, so this is what I'm calling a naive parallel scan algorithm. It's actually not exactly right to call it naive because on some computers this would be, like the connection machine, this would be the efficient parallel scan algorithm. Um, but on a GPU this is not very efficient. And so wh what happens is all we do is first we read the input in from device memory to shared memory and we actually shift it right one element and put a zero in the first element that's so, that's so we get an exclusive scan. Um, and then we iterate log n times and each time we have a stride and it starts out as one and each element or each thread reads the element one, the stride element to the left and adds it to its own element and then writes it out to its own location. Um, and then the next iteration, the stride becomes two and then four and then eight. Um, so it doubles each time and takes log n steps. And then when you're done, you've got the scanned result and you can write it out from shared memory to, to device memory. Um, Another thing you notice that this requires, because they're overwriting the results, um, this requires double buffering. So that's what the T0 and T1 are. They're just two different arrays in shared memory. Um, so why did I call this a naive? Well, if you look at it, it executes log n parallel iterations, um, but the steps, when you add them all up, it works out to n log n uh, total operations. And if you do this sequentially, you know it takes um, n minus 1 adds, and that means that this is not work efficient. Um, because uh, So um, we would like a work efficient algorithm. Um, and so there's a common parallel algorithm pattern that we can use to, to achieve that, and that's um, using what are called balanced trees. And algorithms that use balanced trees typically build a balanced binary tree on their input data and then sweep it to and from the root. And this isn't an actual tree data structure with, you know, pointers to back to parents or anything like that. It's just a conceptual um, data structure. The data is just in an array. So for scan, we traverse from the leaves to the root, building partial sums. So it's kind of like just doing the parallel reduction, except that we need to keep all the intermediate values. Um, and when we get to the root, that's the sum of all the leaves. 
And then you traverse back from the roots of the leaves and build the scan from those partial sums. And this, this algorithm uh, is originally described um, by Guy Blalock. Okay, so how do we do this? Um, let's assume that this array is already in shared memory for simplicity. Um, well, on the first iteration, we have um, n over two threads and n elements in shared memory, and we have a stride of one, and each element basically reads an element to its left, adds it to its own element. So we're basically doing a, a reduction here, and the next time we have the stride, the stride doubles, etc. But notice that we're we're keeping all the intermediate values um, that we've added, and um, when we get to the bottom or the the root of the tree, the sum is is the total sum of all the elements. Um, then what we do uh, is we actually zero that total sum out. And uh, what's going to happen is after we do that in the down sweep phase, the uh, zero is going to propagate back to the beginning so that we get our exclusive scan. But um, so now in the other phase, what we do is each, at each level, we start with the same stride we ended with on the other pass. So in this case, it's four. And we do this kind of um, swap and add operation where we, we store the previous value of the element we're going to update to the value stride elements away, and we add the, value, the original value, the previous value stride elements away to our previous value to get the new value. And then we just we double the number of threads each time and have the stride um, until we get down, and you can see that we have the, the final scan result. So if you look at that, the total number of steps was two times log n. Um, total work is two times n minus one adds, which is order n. So this is work efficient. <coughs> Now, um, I'm not going to go any further into further optimizations of this because there are quite a few um, that I've done. But uh, suffice to say that um, it's not enough to be work, work efficient. And I'll talk about this tomorrow with reduction, not with scan. But you want to be cost efficient, which means basically the number of um, threads or processors times the number of um, operations. and this algorithm is not cost efficient, but there's a way we can make it cost efficient um, to get better performance than we do in practice. But um, in terms of actual performance, how does this perform in CUDA? Um, really well. Uh, you can see here we have the green line is the CUDA implementation. Um, and we have a previous implementation in OpenGL in light blue and a, our naive CUDA implementation in dark blue. And you can see that um, because of the, the, the difference in factor just by, from work efficiency is about the same as not having shared memory, which is what the OpenGL implementation would do. It has to go all the way out to device memory and back every time, which means it's a very it's much more bandwidth bound. Um, and then the CPU implementation is here in, in orange or red. And I think, the, so the speed up, this was a, um, a single core of an Intel Core 2 Duo um, was about a factor of 20. And the speed up versus OpenGL is about a, about a factor of seven. <coughs> yeah. Transfer. No, right now I'm just measuring the scan, scan performance because in some cases this might be used as a building block in a larger algorithm and the data might already be on the GPU. Um, yeah, it's just a comparison to computing all those intermediate values. There, are, I mean, there are cases where you might need, I've seen cases like in Monte Carlo, for example, if you need to keep all the intermediate samples uh, along a path, then one way to do it instead of, I mean, on the CPU, you usually just do your computation at each sample and, and, and add to the previous one. But you could also just do your computation on each sample and then do a scan of it. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of a, an artificial comparison. But Okay, so applications of this. Um, just raw stream compaction, like say we're doing collision detection and we've generated a uh, list of um, results for each thread. Each one thread does one pair of objects for the collision and we get out a true or false value saying there's a collision or not, or there's a potential collision or not. Um, well, w w to compact that, all we do is um, <coughs> we scan the flags that say whether it's a colliding or not. And that gives us an index where each thread that, or each, yeah, each thread that has a, a colliding pair can write its result. It's very simple. Um, 
there's some performance numbers here. I'm not even sure if they're up to date because I haven't run it recently, but uh, it might be a little faster than that. But. Um, also, one thing to note on this is that the performance depends on the number of elements retained because we're doing this scatter right, which is, if you looked at this, and I haven't talked about coalescing yet, that'll be tomorrow, this would be non-coalesced. Um, so if you have very few missing or invalid out elements, then everything would be coalesced, but there'd be more, more data to write, for example. So um, there are ways to kind of stage this in shared memory and then write it out, coalesce, which would mean that it wouldn't depend on the number of elements retained, but it makes the code a little bit more complex. Um, okay, another application is radix sort. So um, here we have on our input um, our data in binary form. These are just three bit values. And at, we're going to run basically a pass per bit and split based on um, that bit. So in this case, we're just showing the least significant bit. Um, here, so this second row shows the least significant bit. Um, and uh, then I think what, yeah, what this actually does is it inverts that bit and then it scans those, the result. Um, this is wrong. This should be, I think, three. <laughs> um, and then we compute this value total falses, which is um, the um, one in E, the last element of E plus the last element of F. So it's, it actually would work out to four. Um, and that you can see that showing up here. So then you compute this value T, which is equal to I, which is the threads index, um, minus F plus the total falses. Um, and so that you can see that computed here, and you end up with four, four, five, 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 six, seven, eight. And then we compute the index where each thread is going to write um, its, its data using um, this, D, this ternary operator, which says that if B is true, in other words, if its flag was if its bit is 1, um, then we write out the value of t. Otherwise, we write out the value of f. And so you can see then this ends up being 0, 4, 1, 2, 5, 6, 7, 3, which basically just resorts those values so that you've got all the zeros at the beginning and all the ones at the end. So that's a split operation that I mentioned before. And so we just do that again for each bit that we want to sort by, and the end result is um, we've sorted the values. So our sort routine um, can sort 4 million key value pairs in about 80 milliseconds. Actually, that might be a lie. I don't know if that number is for key value pairs or just for the keys. Um, so, uh, and also, we, ha we actually, um, in the paper, have two different versions of the sort. One of them does a radix sort per block and then does a merge between the blocks. Basically, does log n merge passes. Uh, well, not log n, but log block size, I guess, um, or log number of blocks. Um, and the other one just does a global scan across the entire big array um, for each bit um, to do the, the split operation. And it turns out that the merge is really inefficient, so the, um, the global scan-based version is, is faster. Um, so another application that I implemented was summed area tables. So a summed area table is basically a 2D array um, where each element in the array is... So if you take a 2D array as input and you generate a summed area table from that, the summed area table, each element in the summed area table is the sum of all values um, below and to the left of it, or depending on your... You can, above and to the left of it, whichever way you want to do it. And so you can actually use that for image processing to perform box filters and you can do arbitrary width box filters at each pixel for the same cost because all it is is the, you basically do a box filter by um, comp reading the corners in the uh, summed area table and then doing some arithmetic on them to compute the, basically the, the sum inside the box. And then you divide by the number of pixels. Um, and it turns out it's really easy to compute a summed area table. It's scan. All you do is scan all the rows and then all the columns. And what we do in practice is we scan all the rows and then we transpose and then we scan all the columns because otherwise we'd be striding across rows and we get really bad memory access patterns. Um, and we can transpose efficiently by staging in, in shared memory, um, which I'll talk about tomorrow. Um, 
And so we can do that. And these are old numbers. This has gotten faster because I realized um, there were some performance bugs in my code. But um, the summed area table, I think, is probably well under three milliseconds now um, for a 1,024 by 1,024 image. Um, and so in this, this case, I'm using this to do what's called depth of field, where you know, you've got some um, non-pinhole lens, and, you, and so things that are close closer than the focal plane are out of focus and things that are farther from the co focal plane are out of focus and you can move the focal plane front and back and, and this is fake, it's not real physical um, depth of field blur but um, you know it's, it's a nice hack which is what computer graphics is all about. Um, okay, so segmented scan. So this, this is an extension to scan that turns out is, is really useful. Um, so in a lot of problems, you have the, the array is split up into chunks, and those chunks might change over time throughout the algorithm, but you still want to be able to do scans of those chunks. And it's more efficient, usually, to scan them together using this segmented scan algorithm than to just do a bunch of sequential scans starting at different points in the array. Um, if for nothing else, just for the fact that by doing them all together using a segmented scan, all of your loads and stores are aligned and coalescible and things like that. So, um, but basically what scan, segmented scan does is it takes your input array and then a, an array of segment head flags. And there's other ways to represent them. You can use pointer, head pointers or um, the length of each segment. Um, we use head flags. And then you generate a result where each of the segments indicated by the head flags is scanned separately. So pretty simple. Um, not as simple to implement um, as scan, and, um, but it enables another class of parallel algorithms. So, for example, we can do parallel quick sorts. Um, we can do parallel sp sparse matrix vector multiplies using um, standard compressed sparse row format, um, which is nice. Um, and if you want more information, I'm not going to go into it. You can see, see our paper. Um, Okay, and then um, I'm, this is the end of my talk, but basically I just wanted to um, talk about QDPP, which is the CUDA Data Parallel Primitives Library, which uh, is a collaboration um, I've been involved with with UC Davis, uh, John Owens and Shubo Gupta specifically. And we've just released it um, Monday, um, on, and it's available on gpgpu.org. And it currently basically has support for what's in the GPU Gems 3 article, which is scan, uh, radix sort, <coughs> stream compaction. And um, it's a beta release. The code, the interface is going to change. So if you're using it, don't use it for serious code right now. Hopefully we'll, we'll finalize the interface and then we'll be adding new features like reductions and segmented scans and have examples of these other algorithms like quick sort and stuff. So, um, okay, so, so this Conclusion slide I stole from Dave, but actually he stole it from me, so you've already seen it, so um, I'm not going to speak to it, but uh, any questions? <coughs> right. All the questions were in, the, in Dave's session. I already, answer, I already answered all your questions. Yeah. yeah. Um, that is a good question. The question is, do we guarantee for parallel reductions, for example, that um, uh, two runs, two subsequent runs of the same uh, computation on the same data will get the same answer? And the underlying question, or an the reason for that question is that floating point arithmetic is non-associative. Um, and no, we can't guarantee that. But if you run it on the same device twice, with the same thread configuration, I'm pretty sure that you'll get the same answer because really the threads are probably going to run in the same, because the, the branches, there's no data dependent branches in there. There's no, nothing timing influenced. So, you know, if, if our hardware was non-deterministic, we'd have a lot of problems, you know, other problems, I think. But, um, we, but in general, no, we don't get, make any guarantees about or even document the order that threads are executed because that's going to change from architecture to architecture. So. That's really a pretty fundamental yeah. problem with parallel computing. I mean, and, and my personal belief is that we are all as uh, 
um, scientists and engineers going to have to just bite the bullet someday and stop pretending that you can represent a real number with, with, floating with point. a single <laughs> string of float, you know, without you know, error bars. And so, you know, I think we're just going to have to deal with it. Any parallel hardware has fundamentally got this problem. You know, guaranteeing order of sequential, you know, guaranteeing order, you know, floating point's not associative. Yeah, I understand. But so I, I, what, that's what a very interesting problem. That is by writing slower versions of the algorithm, which will guarantee the order of Yeah, or yeah. For example, you can yeah. sort you can sort your you can sort your data first, and then then reduce it. Uh, yeah. Like yeah. You don't want to have to do that though. I mean, you have the same problems on a big distributed memory machine. If you handle asynchronous messages, for example, the messages might come in a different order from one. To do that. You could use fixed arithmetic instead, and then you don't have Oops, to Yeah. Yeah, you can always make it work. It's just going to cost you something. Uh, no. <coughs> okay. We're, we're, we're not going to pretend to solve these you know, fundamental problems. Yeah. 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 <laughs> a, a real problem at the heart of parallel computation. I wasn't listening, but oh, sorry. Set operations. Set in operations in parallel. Union. Yeah, things like union, that. find, yeah. intersect. No, <laughs> I haven't. I'm sure. I'm sure it's out there. Union, union find would work pretty well. Yeah, I think. Oh, you haven't done it on GPUs. Right? No, I haven't well, done, it, done it. Not yeah, not that's true. It has been done on GPUs, but not in CUDA. Yeah, or not published in CUDA. It may have been done. Um, uh, so yeah, it's not something that I have experience with, but a lot of times this, this kind of stuff, like all the scan work, was a matter of kind of doing, just picking up all the papers from the early 90s and figuring out how to apply it, apply it to the new architecture. Isn't that just the case with school of This is a tiny projector. Um, that's better. <laughs> 